friends and enemies, do I have a treat for you tonight? The one, the only nuclear Bitcoiner, Ryan McLeod, uh, McLeod is here. We're going to be talking about a lot of things. Ryan, um, obviously you guys know him. He's been on the show, I think twice before. This is probably his third appearance. It's either second or third appearance. I forget. Maybe more than that, actually. He, he's, you know, the guy to go to for all things nuclear and Bitcoin and nuclear even more broadly, maybe. It's, um, you know, a big topic these days in energy. It's a big topic in Bitcoin. It's a big topic in, you know, green and whatnot. Some stuff that we, you know, look with disdain on from time to time. But it's important tech. It's maybe the most important thing uh, we've achieved as a civilization, a species in terms of uh, energy provision. So we're going to talk about that today. But as always, before we start the sponsors, Easy DNS, Mark and the team, the best in the business when it comes to DNS, VPS, all that good stuff. So you know, I'll tell you a story. There was a listener to the show who sent me a DM a couple of days ago. He was trying to buy a couple of uh, domains, as all good Bitcoin Bitcoiners should do. And uh, there's a hang up, I guess, with the um, with the promo code or something. Some some weird, you know, weird you know, exemption or uh, fringe case here. None other than Mark himself hopped into action, helped sort the problem out, made sure that this guy got what he needed, and uh, now we got a happy domain owner, actually owner of multiple domains, I believe. You can't get that kind of customer service in most places, let alone uh, you know a business like EasyDNS, which has been around for more than a decade, uh, you know, almost almost twenty years now, I think, if I remember the founding date, it's like early two thousands. But Mark, left to correct me on that. You're not going to get that kind of service everywhere. And, uh, you know, especially not from the proprietor, founder, co founder. On top of that, if you ever want to get, you know, some support with what you're doing, whether it's VPS stuff, you want to do virtual private server with Mark and the team over at EasyDNS, you want to do a Bitcoin node, Nostra Relay, uh, nodeless implementation, you name it, uh, whatever you want, you can get it done there. Host your email there. Me and Len are working on the at Canadian Bitcoiners emails. Got to be pretty soon. I'm tired of using Gmail like a cuck. Got to work on that. And uh, he's helping with all that stuff. And then, of course, if you go to CanadianBitcoiners.com, you can see what we've put together with Mark's help uh, for the website. We post there every week a couple of times. We have a couple of guest writers, whether it's the weekly news roundup, uh, the weekly research stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think I said on yesterday's show, some recent content from our buddy Bitcoin Scribe on payment apps. All there, all powered by EasyDNS. So if you want to use them, you should. Go to easydns.com, use our promo code CBP Media, or just tell him we sent you. Tell Mark we sent you. Hit him up on Twitter, hit him in the chat here. He's with us most of the live streams, um, Monday nights, Wednesday nights, so or Tuesdays, I guess, in this case. Uh, always around, always ready to help. It's a great company. We're happy to be partnered with them. And the second company, of course, we're happy to be partnered with as well, Bull Bitcoin. So you guys know that I think on the 15th, the last day uh, for KYC Free Bitcoin, at least for now. Uh, via the bull Bitcoin QR code slash uh, post office method that we've been so happy with as a um, as a podcast and as a sponsor. And I know you, Len and I use it a bunch and I, I'm sure you guys do too. So, you know, that is ending for now, but don't forget, okay, bull is the most mission focused Bitcoin company in the space. You will not catch Francis in any Twitter space, podcast appearance, talking about anything but Bitcoin and driving Bitcoin forward. There is no other consideration. There is no fiat consideration. It is Bitcoin or it is death. And uh, they may even sell a shirt with that on it. I'm not 100% sure, but nothing would surprise me. If you want to pay your bills in Bitcoin, price is up right now compared to you know two months ago, although down compared to yesterday. You can do that too. Bills is on their platform, BYLLS. You want to pay your phone bill, your property tax, whatever. They got you covered. And don't forget, okay, non-custodial, make sure you have your addresses ready. you got to control the keys on, on the wallet to which you send your Bitcoin when you buy. And baked-in privacy, coin joins on every single outgoing transaction. You can't beat it. Use the promo code. I want Bitcoin.ca is the website. I forget what our promo code is because I've said it basically zero times. Len always does the read, so forgive me for that. But um, yeah, uh, great company. We're happy to be with them as well. I'm going to bring Ryan on. Um, you know, the biggest story in terms of CBP today was going to be that I am showing some guy thigh, but now it's going to be your jersey. I need to get one of these jerseys. I was at the Your Life, Your Terms event on the weekend, and uh, Anthony DeGazin is running uh, Finlit, this like literacy, financial literacy program for kids with his buddy Mark Mulder. Had the jersey on, that same one, I'm pretty sure. And I am more and more jealous every time I see them. So um, first of all, you look great. Second of all, how are you doing? Does your mood match your appearance? 
I am in a very great mood right now. There's so many reasons to be excited. There's just Bitcoin's exciting, nuclear power is exciting. And yeah, the jersey, I picked it up at last year's conference. I almost didn't get it, but then I was going to Minneapolis for a nuclear conference the next week. And part of the um, one of the events we were going to was a Twins game. So I was like, well, I need to have a ball jersey. So I picked it up. And then that's how <laughs> I missed out on the pizza that they had for the speakers at the conference because I got caught up t- talking for so long. And then that happens. And I hear that we're getting hockey jerseys this year. Yeah, that is the word. We have hockey teams this year. And um, <laughs> uh, it's going to be a shit show, but uh, I have signed up to play in uh, net for the Canadian team. You're the goalie. <laughs> Dude, I was yeah. on the on the weekend. We were talking, me and the bull guys were talking, and the rumor was we couldn't get goalies. And so you're telling me you're playing goalie for the Canadian team? I saw there was a posting by the Hodler's official that they were looking for a goalie. And I was like, well, <laughs> I, I've got pads and skates that haven't worn it in 13 years but uh what better reason to come out of retirement and then i can now i can tell my parents and be like yo dad i'm playing for team canada and he's gonna be like, what in the what are you talking about it's like yeah i, I expect so i'm good. not the only one coming out of retirement for this one that's well gonna be a, I, I don't know like you're show. i think you're a little younger than me but i haven't played hockey since i was like in grade eight and i have skates that i bought maybe 10 years ago and I tell myself every year I'm going to get them sharpened, get get the edges put back on them, and I just never do. And uh, I got to be honest, it's tempting to play in that game. I'm going to be busy Thursday night now, and I'm not going to be able to play in it or even make it. But I know Brandon from Green Candle is going to be doing the play-by-play, which should be good. And I hope he finds a competent partner. I wasn't able to join him, obviously, for that either. But, okay, so question for you then on the hockey front before we keep going. Who do you think is the best Canadian Olympic goalie in the last like 30, 40 years. Like I think a lot of people are partial to Brodeur, but I think you yeah. make a case for like Cujo or Wa or Belfour. Where do you land? I don't know. It is hard to pick because like those all the ones you listed off were ones from my era when I used to pay a lot more attention to hockey. But yeah, I haven't been paying too much to professional sports these days. But uh yeah, I'd I would have to go with Brodeur. Brodeur was one of one of my favorites. And then, like, the and then like and then like I was also a, a fan of uh Kolzig from the Germans because he was uh, oh yeah, yeah Olaf Kolzig I forgot one, about that guy yeah because that was that was back when like I was a big fan of the the Capitals around the time that when they signed Ovechkin and and it came about from me playing online NHL because <laughs> the Capitals were the shittiest team in the league and no. so it was the only thing I had to do so I just got really good with the shittiest team and played in leagues and wrecked people and then I just <laughs> yeah became a Capitals fan out of that you love to see it. You love I, I love it. you guys talking about NHL '94, but like I'm, 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 a, I'm partial to uh, the, some old school Blades of Steel. That was, oh that was my man, jam. Blades, Blades of Steel, ice hockey. Those are really the best games. If Len had you know any kind of sense, he would do a podcast about those. The the depth of the fan club for those those games is like you know Olympic swimming pool deep, and uh, I w- I would love to see something about that. Okay, so let me let me tell people here kind of what we're doing. You and me traded DMs a little while ago. I know we talk a little bit about nuclear on the show from time to time. And I got to be honest, we are like over our heads when it comes to sort of policy um, and maybe protection of quality nuclear energy programs around the world, but specifically Europe, North America. And the reason we look at those two countries more often than not is because I think that there's a, a real chance that whatever happens in those countries in, in terms of policy, both in, both on the energy front and on the Bitcoin front, is going to drive outcomes around the rest of the world, especially the modern world. Maybe not LATAM, maybe not some of these other, um, you know, on the on the fringe adopters. But for you and I, it's going to be a big deal. And one of the reasons, you know, we wanted to bring you back on is because there's no one better to talk to about this, like I said in the intro. So maybe we should start with, in Canada, Ryan, what is the state of the nuclear energy uh, picture? for us where are we now what should we be looking at how do we get here maybe the last like six eight months whenever the last time you were on yeah well there's been i think several more announcements about uh developments with different uh, part stakeholders and provinces that want to participate in getting nuclear power but ontario i think today or yesterday sometime this week they um went reached their 10 year milestone of being completely uh coal free from our grid and that is thankfully for from our nuclear power fleet that we have and that's very well maintained um currently i think there's three reactors down for refurbishments and they mm-hmm. they're cycling through i think they'll be completely finished the entire fleet by 2030 well 2032 was the original plan but now they might be adding pickering to the list so that's going to extend it so but they're gaining a lot of experience 
and doing these projects ahead of schedule on budget and it's uh it's it's very reassuring that there are some parties in the nuclear sector that are very competent at developing this infrastructure because <laughs> Vogel was a bit of a shit show. Like there's plenty of reasons for that. And any, if anybody wants to do a deep dive on it, um, the De Decoupled podcast has like a three part series that goes through very detailed on all of the uh, the shit show that building Vogel was and all tell, the parties. Tell people involved. what Vogel is. I only know it yeah. a little bit because I do listen to Decoupled when I have time. But tell people a little bit what, about what that is, because we've never talked about it on the show. Okay. Yeah, Vogel is a pair of nuclear reactors that were just completed in Georgia. They're the AP-1000 design. But when they were started, the process started in like 2005. And there was there there was a bit of overcommitment on that the design was complete before it was done. And there was lots of engineering changes on the fly and, and getting along with regulators. And then some stakeholders started to sue other stakeholders because there was like QA qualifications that weren't being met. And it, it was it, it was it was a mess. But the thing about it, though, is the job got done. The reactor's complete. They have a complete design now. They've re-established a really good supply chain to develop those reactors and they've got the labor force. So the smart move would be to parlay that into building more of these things and not just let all of that uh, painstaking effort go to waste after the billions of dollars that got poured into it in the many, many years waiting. And then there was also a second pair of reactors that was supposed to be built in, I think, South Carolina at the, the summer site. And partway through, they just got completely scrapped hmm. because it was just the cost overruns and the stakeholders involved in that one were not willing to completely uh, follow through on it. So it is actually miraculous that Vogel even got completed as it did. But now that it is online, it is a, an impressive milestone that they finally reached. So yeah, there's a lot of talk about building more. And then there's a lot of interest in yeah, SMRs all over the place for various sizes, different, uh, different heat outputs, different fuel types, different uh, coolant types that can be used to apply to non-electrical applications for nuclear and have different uh, sized grids and off-grid applications. And yeah, there's nuclear wants to reach into a lot more, more uh, markets where the traditional large reactors aren't really a good fit, but there is a huge resurgence in a lot of interest in these large reactors. Like even um, at the, the COP conference, there was 23 or 24 countries signed on to a pledge to triple global nuclear capacity by 2050. But one oh. thing that was notable is on that pledge, the three countries that are actively building the most nuclear power at the moment, India, China, and Russia, were not actually part of that pledge, which is kind of just, they're just building. They don't need to make these grandstanding pledges about it. And they, <laughs> but, but, but they've also been like, yeah, they're, they're like the black sheep of the international community. They kind of get they don't get the uh, to stand with in all the pictures with uh, everyone else yeah. these days. <laughs> no, exactly. So one thing you mentioned there that I I want to it's a thread I want to pull on, and we talked about it a bit in the past on you know in different silos. This idea that we're doing things now and displaying you know competency, and I think you use the word practice. We're getting reps basically in building these things. One of the concerns I have about infrastructure in Canada, and I'm sure the Americans share it, and I'm sure there's European countries that share the same concern. I don't think there's a lot of people who understand how these systems truly work and what they're built on. And what we've seen in the last, you know, year, especially when it comes to stuff like, you know, uh, roads, bridges, electrical infrastructure, um, airplanes, for God's sake, uh, you're operating what looks to be a, a, like on a pretty significant technical deficit. And it's just, they're building things on old systems because they don't know how the old systems work and you wind up causing new problems for yourself and having these unreliable uh, finished products, right? Whether it's a power plant, a bridge, a plane, a car, whatever. Is it is it fair to say, and I, like, I'm not really a person that's worried about this, but I know people who are. Is it fair to say that nuclear, from the standpoint of whether it's going to win out long-term, is it is it like a, you know, ordained is too strong a phrase, but like, it seems to me almost a guarantee because we're just not building a lot of other power sources or power plants or energy output from scratch anymore, except this stuff. The refurbishing process is pretty significant from what I understand. Is, is there opportunities for guys to quote unquote, get reps in other, you know, power silos? There's got to be a better way to phrase that, but it seems to me like nuclear is the one that everyone is building and working on. And this is the one that's going to naturally take over because that's where we're going to have the new generation 
of expertise, not this older stuff. Well, it's definitely become the attractive shiny new object these days because everyone, as as the strategies of the last decades or so appear to be showing cracks and not manifesting as they were promised and like noticing that like there's a lot of um, a lot of deals uh, that we're planning to build solar and wind all over the place are falling through mm -hmm. because they they need guarantees of higher rates in order to be profitable so they're just not getting built which is preferable to them being built with capital that they were given freely and terribly misallocated and then building these things and then having to survive purely off of subsidies and then that creates distortions in these grids and and like yeah like that's another like what you said like it's just, we're almost sabotaging ourselves like getting in reps is 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 important for for like building these things but we're actively making it difficult to develop like hydro hydrocarbon infrastructure these days like we're we're deterring intellectual capital from entering these sectors because they're seeing policy pointing in a direction that that we're trying to reduce the amount of these vital industries that we have supporting like our very high tech society but it's yeah it is reassuring to see that we're finally coming back around to nuclear because yeah like I, I i don't have like i'm not completely opposed to the wind and solar but the way mm -hmm. that they were just being mass applied everywhere that they could find the land to build them and then damn the ability to actually like even connect them to the grid in a reasonable time frame don't consider the fact that like as you're if you're building a lot of these all at the same time then they're all starting to cannibalize each other's infrastructure when they and they causes grid congestion it causes negative prices and just all kinds of negative consequences and like uh, a good book to read on this is meredith angwin's shorting the grid she goes into great detail like explaining how like subsidies and a lot of these incentives create distortions that then have negative consequences for our base load generators and then instead of building and continuing to develop our this this infrastructure because it's all just like one giant machine that has different nodes connected to each other from generation to transmission to consumers at the end like it's it's got a lot of moving parts that needs a lot of competent individuals that have had the time to develop those expertise in these in these markets but we had the good chunk of time where yeah people were attracted to like the tech industry to finance industry people want to just be online stars nowadays it's just yeah. the, this the 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 drain away from trades and engineering and all of the the talents that we need to maintain a high tech society don't seem to be manifesting as as uh, we were assured that they would be and but then you, the way that we see it like you, you just start seeing the incentives and it all makes sense it's just People aren't motivated to do the hard work these days because fiat just creates the easy path for everyone. Yeah, it's, you know it's game like, it. yeah, it's clearly a problem. Uh, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on why there's been such a significant swing of the pendulum toward nuclear. You mentioned the COP conference, you know, 23 or 24, I can't remember what you said, um, member states signing a declaration is significant it is a little bit of a grandstand dog and pony show type thing but that's what those conferences are for so it's significant in that regard and then you mentioned also china russia india which i think is you know what 30 percent 40 percent of the entire world's population it's some significant number they're all building nuclear at a rate that's basically unprecedented and much greater than anywhere else in the civilized world what changed you know you mentioned that we went from this uh this like determination tunnel vision building wind and solar everywhere all the time at any cost for any grid purpose for any need set no matter what it was there was no tailoring it just was a plug and play solution it was popular in politics popular in media and popular for uh, energy activists as well and suddenly that's flipped what happened what what was the big difference because as far as i can tell you know short of um what's going on in parts of europe this this sort of energy slash economic suicide at the hands of uh solar panels and wind turbines I don't know what else changed. It's a lot of the same people in power since two years ago. A lot of the same activist groups are prominent. What was the big shift in your view? Was there one? What happened? I don't know. It feels like something around 2021 20, is when the shift really started to happen. Because I only started to really pay attention early in 21 because it was on the tail end of me 
figuring out Bitcoin. And then I was just like, well, I'm in the nuclear industry and I can totally figure out how this applies. And then I went deep down both rabbit holes at the same time. And yeah, there was like just the, the public sentiment and the policy sentiment was was definitely unfavorable towards nuclear. And then around the COP conference in 2021, something really changed and it seemed like more people within the, the broader public that were starting to feel the pain and observe these these policies actually manifesting because like there's a lag effect to, to all this like you you build these things and you build them all over the place and then you don't start seeing the like the diminishing returns until they're all over the place and then you start seeing congestion in your uh getting your transmission infrastructure connected so that all these things can actually get connected to the grid and then when they are connected to the grid they cause all kinds of chaos because they generate power not um synchronously with the frequency of all of the the spinning generation that's on the grids from your the hydro and the nuclear and uh, uh, the thermal sources because they they have to maintain a very specific frequency it's basically like a heartbeat so they have to have extra infrastructure in place that brings the, the wind and solar infrastructure in line so it's great that you can produce free electricity on the spot at the site and if you can consume it on site that is great because yeah you have minimal costs but as soon as you need to put that on the grid and deliver it to customers there's all kinds of extraneous costs that that get added into it but i i think that that was only really possible in the the policy environment where the zero interest rate policy was the reigning the day and these were one of the great beneficiaries of those policies they were getting very low interest loans they were getting the 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 um the ITC, I forget what that one stands for, the, the infrastructure tax credit, the uh, production yeah. tax credit, and, <laughs> and there's all these things. And and then so like they're profitable when the grid price is like negative 10 cents <laughs> and they're still making money. And then you've got your nuclear generators, like they've got to like beg to be like, well, can we at least like get guaranteed like three, four cents a kilowatt hour? Like that's what we have in Ontario. <laughs> like our uh, Bruce and the, the other OPG reactors, they get paid like a flat i think it's like seven eight cents kilowatt hour in canadian that's uh, probably like six cents american yeah but uh maybe even five cents because yeah we're 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 not we're not doing well like like i love seeing it looking at the the all-time high in canadian versus the where where it's at in in american and like we're ten thousand almost like fifteen thousand dollars more than where we were the last time that it was at the this price it's ridiculous sir and our our yeah our dollar is such a shit coin like I can't use can't use it anywhere <laughs> but it's just it's it makes it hard for the nuclear base load generators to make the return on their investment and rec- recover their capital costs when they are constantly having to either pay the grid to take their power or not earn anything from it all by by curtailing so like a lot of what ontario does is we when our, we're running at full capacity, we'll, we'll export to the to the northern states. But then the northern states became kind of dependent on those imports. And then they decided that, oh, we can just shut down our nuclear reactors. <laughs> and they'll just be replaced magically by windmills and solar panels. Incredible. And as we see, Indian Point has been predominantly replaced by natural gas and imports. Palisades was replaced by natural gas and imports. Pilgrim, natural gas and imports. These are just like four or five reactors just all along the Northeast Corridor that this was completely went against the conventional wisdom at the time that, yeah, reality did not match what their fantasy was of how it was going to play out. And now there's a actual, a frantic effort to re- um, restart Palisades reactor in Michigan. And I would not be surprised if that prompts others to possibly look at the possibility of, of re um, restarting some of those other reactors that were shut down. I had heard something about there's some reactors in New Jersey that were considered uh, for being shut down within the next three or four years that are now being looked at for life extensions and refurbishments. Um, like even Gentilly 2 in Quebec, there's been rumors that there's there's serious talk about refurbishing that, which would be very interesting. And and that would be a really, really good um, to thumb in the, note, thumb in the eye of our uh, environment minister, because he was one of the uh, lead activists petitioning to get it shut down in the first place. What What is but, the rationale for someone like Minister Guibault to want to shut down nuclear? You know, politics aside, I don't necessarily think that even a common sort of person with rudimentary understanding of energy policy or energy generation, you know, if, if you realize or know, or have done a little bit of research 
you're pretty quickly put at bay when it comes to common concerns. Like the waste is not as dangerous as you think. And the half-life is not as significant as you might believe. And there's never really been a death from a nuclear you know, plant accident outside of Chernobyl, maybe depending on how you qualify some of those deaths. Um, and so like what, what reason does the federal government have to oppose these things apart from politics and maybe, you know, a, a decades old blood feud with a, you know, energy generation method. I, I just don't see it. And I, I can't imagine you do either, but you must know what they're saying, at least. What are they saying? Well, a lot of it's ideological driven and, and fear, obviously, just from an older generation that was exposed to a lot more um, <laughs> scary narratives about nuclear and the possibilities. And they, they lived through through those events that were like, yeah, like they were tragic events, but they were definitely overhyped and sensationalized relative to the actual uh, results of of any exposure of, to the, the public. But mm -hmm. um, like there's, yeah, like the... There was more more fatalities in that bridge accident the other day than yeah. like Fukushima and yeah. Chernobyl. So it's like like it happened. Like industrial accidents happen. Radiation is just another industrial hazard that we know how to manage, we know how to detect, and we know how to control it. It's really, it's really not that big of a deal. But because it's very poorly understood by the broader public, it can be scary, especially since most of their exposure to it is, yeah, popular culture, Simpsons, and yeah, like. Yeah, like isn't that yeah, something, it, it, Ryan? Like you would never do this anywhere else. We don't, we don't, maybe the only other place we see this sort of spectacular picture of the threat of a certain kind of technology is like artificial intelligence, right? Everyone thinks of iRobot instead of just thinking about a, you know, a, a chat window that spits out a piss poor grade 10 essay Wikipedia style, you know, like, but really there's no, like the danger is not as bad as everyone thinks. And so I guess maybe the next logical question in terms of like, you know, why the government opposes it's, it's ideological. I think in a lot of cases, Who's leading the charge for refurbishing in these in these um, in these in these instances, instances you mentioned, like the Quebec? Um, I forget the name of the plant there, but it's interesting because th there there was really no voices outside of nuclear advocates years ago that were pushing for this, but that wasn't enough then. So there must have been someone added to the pool of you know voices. Who's in the chorus now? Who's who's making all the noise? It's probably mostly coming from the utilities because they have been screaming that what is being done to the grid that they are trying to manage is making mm -hmm. their job incredibly difficult and challenging. And like I, I, the, I was, uh, everyone was excited about the eclipse yesterday, and I was more interested in seeing what the uh, the power market charts were going to look like, and just seeing that dip in the middle of the day of solar just disappearing and the natural gas ramping up like seven, eight gigawatts for ten minutes. God, you are for sure on the spectrum, buddy. You know, that's a dead giveaway there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I talk with my hands. But it, <laughs> oh, it's, it was, it was, it was just, it's just so much interesting things going on in our power systems right now. And we have intentionally started to sabotage them with the policy that that's being forced upon them. Like you're saying yeah. we like in Canada, you're well, saying like, this too. Everyone knows Europe, well, but like in Canada, like everywhere, this? Europe, Europe, it, it, it's not as bad and prevalent in Canada because we at least like listen to our utilities when they say like, no, like we need to keep the coal online. We need to keep the gas online. We need to keep the nuclear online. We need to extend it for multiple generations so that we like always have these assets available to us. Like it's, Switching to a completely renewable grid like com requires a completely reconfiguration. Like the entire thing has to be re rebuilt. Like it's it's already much so much of like a patchwork of being put together, and it's done in a way that we know that works with so that everything rotates and syncs with each other at the same frequency, so that it can all communicate across like these vast distances and then you start throwing in these other sources that are essentially like communicating with this network in in a, in a way that doesn't align with what it's familiar with and it starts to throw it out of whack and it and it starts to make these men's jobs incredibly more difficult and then they start looking into these things like oh well we can institute these programs where we will incentivize the public to <laughs> lessen their energy usage and it's like yes yes uh, i hear you saying that i'm going to have fun being poor yes we're going to use <laughs> less energy being, like, have fun being cold yeah yeah like yo, oh yes like they've gotten lucky in europe these last few years that winter has been kind of mild because if they got a cold winter they were 
not going to do well. And like, it's like, we're putting people in a position where they have to choose if they want to eat in, in, in a home, in the cold or the dark, like, <laughs> like one of, one of those pieces is it, like you, balancing all of that nowadays is like in affording life is incredibly challenging for a lot of people. And then, yeah, you jacking around something that we've relied upon, like you, like these energy systems for for so long and yeah now people don't know how to cope with it and it's going to be worse for developed countries like watching what's happened in south south africa it's like mm -hmm. i heard the concept of like it's a for of, of being a fourth world country a country that had a developed infrastructure that went in reverse because now you've got all this other <laughs> infrastructure that was built second and third layers on top yeah. of your base power infrastructure and now like i'm hearing things about that they're not able to afford to import natural gas so they're having to shut down some of their it's their large ridiculous. power plants and they're having to ration they have rolling blackouts they're they're like that they, they will say will only last a short period of time but then they'll just extend indefinitely and you can't predict your life around that you can't run a business on that you can't even like keep a freezer full of meat on that <laughs> like that changes people's lives in a dramatic way and you you put people that have like when cities have developed with millions of people if that um reliability leg like, gets kicked out of their energy systems like it'll be mad max pretty damn quick this is so true right people don't realize you know i live in hamilton dundas you know whatever people call it different things but one of the things i i see now where i am and i hear it as well actually there's a power station not too too far from where i am and you know you'd be surprised how often one of those transformers blows it's like once every i don't know couple months maybe in the summertime and uh you know i i said to my wife a little while ago and you're you're making the same point and it's something that's been floating around for a long time i don't know who originally said it you know you're you're basically only about 9 meals away from having to kill somebody for food and you know in canada especially in places like hamilton toronto oakville burlington like the gta gtha um, I would imagine Quebec is like this. I would imagine some parts of BC or Alberta are like this. You're in a you're in a, a a locale where rolling blackouts on during heat waves is like the expectation. There's going to be a power outage or a brownout or something at some point. If it not if everyone is running the air conditioner, be ready for it. Make sure your fridge is closed. Make sure and like I, I realize it's not like dire, but. At the same time, I can't figure out why the provinces and the federal government as well, and perhaps also the people who vote for you know these these ruling parties, these governing parties, do they not realize that we're always a little closer than they think? Do they not consider this? I've, I've always wondered that. It's not really a question for you. I'm just thinking out loud. You know that this idea that we're so close to, like you said, Mad Max, and if we keep going down this road we're, where we're replacing quality, reliable base load with dependence on wind solar and other stuff that you know even in the best of times just isn't as efficient as 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 uh hydrocarbons you know for example um you're you're asking for trouble is there is there a push from the nuclear side of things to say look you know we're already at a point where the grid is you know unreliable it, in the traditional model if we start adding these novel uh, sources, we're going to add problems and the problems are going to be harder to get out of. Like you mentioned there, a place like South Africa, fourth world. When you said, when you said, you know, these guys had a, a system that worked, they went backwards and now they're trying to, you know, that sounds a lot like some places here too. Don't you think? It's definitely getting precarious. Like there was energy warnings in Alberta just the other day. And like, this is the spring when. For what? I, for what? Like, like for I, I, I don't. I don't really know what it was, but like they were saying that there was strain on the grid and they were oh. suggesting that people reduce their power usage. <laughs> it's just, it's happening more and more often in places that were once reliable and affordable. And it's, it's, it's not, not pretty. Like, like it, it seems like we're moving to like everything moved to this just in time delivery mindset. So yeah. we're kind of getting to do that with our electricity. It's just like, Oh, we don't, we don't need reserves. We'll just, we'll just use batteries and we don't, we don't need like, like to have excess capacity. We'll just, we'll just build all these solar panels and we'll just fill the batteries. And then that, that will be our reserves. But like we need to have dispatchable power that can, we can just access whenever we need it. Like, that's that's what the gas is for that's that's where coal and like really serves a, a really 
valuable role to our grids. And like then there's other stuff that's associated with these with the uh, with coal and gas that, that are beyond just their electricity and, and heat usages. Like they're used in, as feedstock for countless other like chemical production processes. So mm-hmm. like, like that's that that's probably what's going to happen as they get displaced as we did put more nuclear into the grid and displacing the need for coal and gas because that's that's where nuclear really shines above the wind and solar because you can't just drop windmills and solar panels of equivalent volume where a coal plant was or a natural gas plant like I, they're kind of trying to do that with um one of the coal plants down in uh, like near niagara and they, the capacity is nowhere near yeah Na- uh, nantico that's the one okay what it used to be like that that was the largest coal plant in the world for a good chunk of time really um, yeah and it was the last wow. one that was retired in ontario before we completely went off coal and um yeah so the the amount of wind and solar that's replacing it is is like a pittance compared to the grid interconnection access that it has there that it could be making available to the grid so that is where they want to do like a nuclear to coal transition because you can just take the old power plant out you can retire it and decommission it and then you can install a nuclear power plant of roughly the same capacity or multiple modules depending on how you want to do it with the next generation of small modular reactors and then you already have access to that legacy power transmission infrastructure so you can just feed right into that with minimal development whereas a lot of these wind and solar projects they're having to be built further and further afield further from their customer base like further from the prime land where they sure. would be best suitable and then that requires more transmission to bring it where it needs to be and then it also starts putting a strain on the supply chain for transformers which then starts to affect a lot of the other customers for this technology that that require those to get online so it takes like i think like 18 months lead time for a transformer in like the best of times but sometimes now they're saying like as much as two to three years is is a reasonable time to wait for, for one a transformer days. come on yeah. like depending on where you are like yeah oh, like, <laughs> oh man like you gotta, I mean, you gotta you know mean... people and like interconnections are taking years like they're saying like oh that's great you've got 100 megawatts worth of, of wind in northern uk but it's going to be five years before you can connect it to the grid it's like like there's it was such a poor planning ahead because they didn't consider all these second order effects of the rest of the supply chain that they're going to need to connect all of this shit together yeah but it's like i think like in this this potential like if we do go to a, like a breakdown of society in mad max like the the in the the, the dark age is like the windmills and the solar panels will just be this broken legacy like the uh the roman aqueducts the relics Europe. the relics yeah, man they'll, they'll just I, be I don't like, know. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever played um horizon for i mean this is a bit far afoot but horizon is like a future you know far future game and to your point there's entire subsections of the map where it's just relics of his poor power generation solar wind you're onto something there. You're not the only one thinking that. <laughs> yeah. Well, like we're building so much of it. And then what one of the things that I've I learned recently is because the tax credits only endure for 10 years, but the product themselves, the windmill, has a lifetime expectancy of 10 to like 25 years or so, they're incentivized to either replace them after 10 years so that that restarts the subsidy clock. Mm -hmm. or to transfer ownership to a local owner so that they are no longer so that someone else is holding the bag for (laughs) end of life maintenance like (laughs) and people are starting to catch on to this like there was actually a major lawsuit i think it was like the the osage tribe uh robert bryce does has a really good piece on this but they i think there's 70 80 or so windmills that they have to tear down because they built them in such rights of the the landowners the the tribe that they uh wanted access to the resources they have on that land but those solar those windmills got built there so they won a court battle to get them taken away so that they can do what they want and it was it and it's interesting because that that's also the same tribe that was portrayed in the that recent um scorsese movie the uh, killers of the flower moon oh really that's, i haven't watched yeah. it yet but i've heard it I heard it's really good well, if I ever have four hours to kill, maybe I'll sit down and uh, watch it. Oh, God, it, I know. Those the, Scorsese movies, they're so good, but they're, God. They're yeah, so I know. It's a, it's a mission. It's a mission. Okay, so you've you've done a killer job here giving us some uh, color context to how we got here, where we are. 
I want to talk a little bit about what's coming next. And, you know, Canada is, I think, this is how I think about it anyway, and I'm not an expert in nuclear, but are we not famous or, you know, have we not become relatively notable for our can-do tech, our, our reactor tech? You know, we I know we have a few of these sort of Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4 reactors maybe. Are we building those still, you know, when you're talking about refurbishing um, plants? Is this what we're doing? Are we advancing the tech in some of these plants? What's on the horizon as far as the sort of Gen 3, 4, 5, whatever, can-do style, I think you'd call it, reactor? And then what about SMRs? Last time you were on, last time we spoke for sure, there was some discussion about SMRs, but this has really become a popular thing to talk about. Eric Townsend on Macro Voices did an entire series on YouTube about nuclear energy. And, you know, there's a huge swath of that series on SMRs. That guy's a big voice in economics and certainly in the podcast space. So you're, you know, your, your, your expertise silo is in the spotlight here. So what, what's, you know, what are we doing? What's next for us and for sort of nuclear more broadly, what should we be looking for? Yeah, not going to lie. Like there's, there's definitely a lot of hopium on the SMR front. Like not every design is going to make it to the market and get to its mature commercialized state. So there's, there's a lot of competition to find the right markets and stakeholders and get policy aligned in various ways and, and get first to the market. So there's going to be a lot of failures, but that's how we move forward. We, yeah, throw as many of, of them at the wall and we see, see what can actually, uh, provide value for us on the can do front yeah the refurbishments are going to be upgrading the basically the internal components of the entire reactor fleet i think 18 in total to be of the most modern can do design um and then there was another announcement that the bruce is expanding with a uh with the with a third site of they want to do a set of four for a total of five gigawatts i don't know exactly what reactor they are planning to do yet it's still out for tender there was a new can do design proposed at a recent um uh, nuclear conference called the uh, the monarch i don't know the exact details if it still uses natural natural uranium like the the traditional can do reactors because that is one of its unique selling points is that the react the uranium fuel does not need to be enriched so that uh, makes it a lot easier to get around a lot of the um the protectiveness oh. that the Americans have over letting other like countries it. access like to it. enrichment. But there is also like a very strong um, movement with the, the Western nations like Japan and, uh, and France and America and Canada and a few of the Scandinavian countries that have nuclear to support uh, fuel development to untangle that supply chain as much as they can from the Russian sources because they let themselves become incredibly dependent on Russia for enriched fuel because they did an amazing job at it for right. many, many decades. They, they, they developed the infrastructure and they were, they were good at it. So there wasn't as much impetus to develop those capabilities elsewhere. So like it, it exists in a few places, but not as robustly as what is being called for and is expected of it, with the nuclear sector having so much more like demand for f fuel in the coming future. Like there was just an announcement that for Romania that they have, they have two incomplete can do reactors that were started in the early two thousands that they just received financing for. Like they already have, they had two operating can do how, reactors. How does, how does that happen? Tell me how this happens. That, that's uh, 25 I, years ago. How, how does that? I yeah. Well, I think, I think it had, was related to the, the Ceausescu government that it was started under them. And then after that was deposed, there was, they just, there wasn't enough financing to, to keep the program going. So they had completed two, I think like 10 years earlier, and then they were going to build two more and mm -hmm. they had just, just barely prepared the sites. And then they didn't have the, the, the financing fell through for obvious reasons when a dictator gets deposed. Sure. And, uh, and yeah, so they haven't pursued that for 20 something years. And yeah, just recently they, there was an announcement that they're going to finance the completion of those reactors. Um, another notable one is that El Salvador has been talking about developing nuclear reactor. They're talking with a, a thorium based reactor company. I'm not as familiar with the thorium supply chain and, and that uh, type of reactor, but it does have a lot of promise to it. And it, it's going to take a lot more development to get the thorium supply chains developed because it, it requires a different preparation process to make it usable as fuel in a nuclear reactor than uranium does. Um, 
Another interesting one is that uh, Serbia was just uh, at a conference and they announced that they're looking into nuclear power. They traditionally had not, like Poland has been talking lots about nuclear power, but uh, the Serbian one I find interesting because I actually had an opportunity to meet Prince Philip when I was in El Salvador for an adopting ah, Bitcoin. So, yeah. yeah, so like, obviously I'm just like, so has uh, any any consideration about nuclear power for Serbia? Nice to, then, nice to meet then, you, by the yeah, way. And, yeah. <laughs> You need nuclear power. Well, I was just I was just started asking. I was just like, so so what's what's the power mix on your grid? And he's like, uh, uh, coal and and gas probably. I was like, you need some nuclear. And then we had a good conversation. And then two years later, Serbia is getting nuclear power. So I like to think that I had a little bit of nudge on that. So I don't know, but like, but I, I'm starting to meet some interesting people and connect some some really interesting parties together to make to get some some work done. Like I I went to the conference in ghana the african bitcoin conference in december and i invited a friend of mine that i met through nuclear advocacy and he's from nigeria and he's all he's a nuclear engineer so he's really smart he's got a lot of familiarity with the electrical system so i brought him to a bitcoin conference and i introduced him to the uh the gridless guys i introduced him to the the guys from the the Varunga project yeah and oh yeah he he got bitten by the the mining bug hard three months later he calls me he's like yo i've, I've got this mining site it's basically got free electricity because they've there's a huge oil plant that has way more power than they know what to do with and there's flares and yeah we just we just need the, the right people to start uh connecting these dots and i'm just like all right i know some people and then yeah in, <laughs> in, in, in no time like he's already got he's already got another team the trojan mining team that's out in nigeria already they're looking at investing in, in helping develop this project uh another guy that reached out through the the oil and gas and bitcoin telegram group just like yeah i'd love to get in on this project so we're going to start seeing a lot more bitcoin mining in nigeria now because i think they just passed a policy that gives a lot more autonomy to local jurisdictions to determine their own like local energy mixes and their own energy needs so it's going to be less central control and more more distributed so it'll be interesting to see how that develops especially with like little projects like this popping up everywhere that's going to make a lot more use of that stranded power that they have everywhere that just doesn't have great infrastructure to deliver it very far beyond where it's generated so they have a great opportunity to tap into a lot of resources there. Do you think nuclear, I mean, this is a big question, but in sort of my limited understanding of the energy sector, it, everything I see tells me that nuclear at some point, you know, should replace or get close to replacing a vast, vast majority of other energy sources, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's the renewables or the, the intermittents. Do, do you share that view? Because I, I just think it's, I don't know. It, it, maybe it, maybe it's not inevitable, but should we really be deploying resources to other energy research at this moment as the population continues to expand quick, more and more quickly, as the needs of the, that population continues to expand more and more quickly, as the third world tries to industrialize and we basically you know, scoff at the idea that they're using oil and gas the way we did? Doesn't it make sense that we should just be pouring all our resources as far as, like you mentioned, like intellectual capital into this sector? Or am I just missing something there? I would love to see that, but I, I would love to see it just more equitable, like less of these like biased policies that favor one source over another and give them unfair advantages that that make it complicated when, when you can only earn a revenue by selling power to the grid and then someone else is making revenue by milking policy and, and lobbying and getting a better mm -hmm. favorable seat at the subsidy trough like it, it becomes very unbalanced because then you're focused on storytelling and getting your narrative out there and and then it, and then it starts creating this animosity where if you start getting even a little bit of a seat at that trough then the other pigs at the trough start looking at you and just like who the fuck's this guy eating my lunch <laughs> and then that's sort of like the, the the sentiment that's going on right now like as nuclear power got like a little token piece of the production tax credit and like the wind and solar people are like how dare they <laughs> i'm just like like we I would rather just none of it and like compete on the merit and actually like impress investors with a business case that you can return their investment and then keep going and build on that investment. But like, that's not the world we live in because all everything is about who can tell a better story to the people that play the cantillionaire game. Yeah. We, we have an election coming up here in about a year. Um, you know, maybe a year, maybe a little less. Do you have a view on, I know no one really knows. Do you have a view on um, 
the differences between the two Canadian parties, the Libs and the Cons, in terms of their energy policies. I think that there's, you know, a, a huge contingent of Bitcoiners who is in this kind of, you know, vote harder daddy camp. I think I'm in that camp. I don't know if you are. I would, I'd imagine you are actually, <laughs> you know, only because we're in a couple of group chats together. But the 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 thing I would just ask you is like, it, it does this, does the, does the vote, does the party, does the banner matter to the energy outcome or are they both sort of equally villainizing these nuclear facilities, the nuclear research, the nuclear industry, um, you know, in this unfair way? Well, in the liberals, truthfully, it's only really Guibault. He's he's the only one that's kind of really hardline against nuclear, but he's even been forced in a few public appearances to talk at least like, oh, well, it's it's necessary. He he doesn't <laughs> he, he does he does the lukewarm thing. He's not very enthusiastic about it, but he's he he says what he has to say to to appease the people in the caucus or whatever. But there's apparently like the liberals, they're very much on board with nuclear power. Like they're they're definitely kneecapping the the oil and gas sector wherever they can, but mm -hmm. whatever. Um, they've got these grand fantasies about hydrogen and like shipping it across the, the sea he's after producing it with our, our windmills <laughs> because Germany doesn't want hydrogen produced with nuclear power because they're a total basket case. But yeah. <laughs> and, and then on the other side, so yeah, liberals, liberals are definitely positive on nuclear power. Like the, the province provinces for the most part are really positive on nuclear power. Like Ontario and New Brunswick are the two provinces that have nuclear Quebec formerly had nuclear and they're kind of lukewarm about getting back into it. Alberta and Saskatchewan have signed on. They want to get in on nuclear power as well. They want to deploy uh, nuclear reactors out throughout the oil sands. They mm -hmm. want to deploy them kind of in, in reactors like, in the oil sands really okay well because the other application is they can put out pretty high heat too so if you're if you're able to output like eight nine hundred degrees celsius steam and and heat you can do that for um like the, the hydrocarbon cracking so you mm -hmm. can actually do the refining of the oil and gas and whatnot with the power generated from a nuclear reactor instead of traditionally with the oil and gas that they're producing on site so that more of that can be exported to the other markets that need it more than we do and we can make a lot of profit off of that because it sounds like there's a lot of nations that would really love canada to expand our <laughs> gas exports but every time they keep getting shut down by our great leader <laughs> story every day <laughs> and, and then yeah but then on the other side the conservatives they're also trying they're like pierre's been making a few overtures that he's 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 like if, if trudeau's gonna be on nuclear i'm gonna be even more nuclear so Traditionally, like they conservatives haven't really been like super into nuclear because the the period when Harper was in office, the, the it, there was a bit of stagnation and and uh, in like hiring and whatnot in this in the sector. But it did come back and it reinvigorated. But that was also kind of coincided with uh, with what happened in Fukushima, and so there was exactly. a lot of a lot of downturn in the sector. So it was it was a weird weird tough time and hopefully it doesn't happen again but there are actually people out there that that would love to give the old i i told you so if something did happen which is <laughs> it, it's frustrating it's frustrating dealing with people that that actually like think like that like that's very negative for the future of humanity if we aren't successful with these technologies but then they also assume that like we haven't learned like there was a someone had asked a question recently like well how do we prevent another chernobyl from happening it's like well, well we don't build 60 year old reactor designs that were yeah. shitty in the first place and and let communist uh regimes manage them you know and skimp on service skimp on training skimp on everything the way that communist regimes do i mean it's not that hard to figure that out i don't think yeah. like and then said. like even what happened in japan with fukushima like they <clears throat> they were they were warned it was a risk and it happened and now they've made uh they've made sure that that's not going to happen again they've built walls around those reactors like big 20 meter tall three meter thick fortress walls with and now they've got floating platforms for their backup generators so mm -hmm. if if another event like that tsunami were to happen the reactor sites would probably be the safest locations on the island so they're they're prepared and they're very eager to get their reactor fleet back online like every other day there's an announcement that they're they're, they're close there's another one coming back online uh within like the next few weeks so they're going to start putting also a lot more demand on the uh, uranium markets and like i don't know if you you see the uranium charts but uh, oh, it was I've a bull them. market for a long time and uh yeah, yeah. yeah things are things are very exciting yeah I, I would say now we can't let you go without asking you about your views on sort of energy 
Bitcoin, uh, maybe some policy stuff. I know we traded DMs about this stuff in Europe where they're really going after energy use as far as mining. The states, um, rather uh, bluntly, not long ago, reminding everybody that they're anti-Bitcoin mining, proposing this 30% excise tax. What do you see in, as far as the landscape for energy use related to Bitcoin mining? Um, is this something you've spent some time on, something you think about often, or do you just view this as a you know, a predetermined outcome. We're going to win at some point. It's just a matter of when, not if. Yeah, well, you can only really ban yourself from using Bitcoin. Like it's going to keep proliferating outside of the walled garden that you put yourself in. So if Europe wants to cut themselves off from this bountiful technology that can make their, their existing power infrastructure more robust and more reliable and create the incentive to build more and expand it, like, that's that's their prerogative and yeah sometimes pain is well often pain is a great teacher and i'd hate to see countries go through like a, a mandibles type of scenario but uh, <laughs> some of them very may well and we here in canada might possibly see uh, an outcome similar to that story <laughs> I really don't want it but like re reading through it it's just like yeah it feels really you can you can relate to these characters that when when shit goes sideways like that like my, my, my favorite part of the story was when when the uh, the college professor uncle gets his paycheck gets his back pay from several <laughs> years before but nominally it looks like it's a lot of money and he goes yeah. to the grocery store packs his <laughs> cart and then people are like who who's who's this, this guy <laughs> and then, yeah and then and then very quickly uh smartens up after after getting mugged and uh yeah, not spoil too much, but they they catch on pretty quick that it's uh, that uh, things went sideways and they weren't paying attention because they were trapped in this worldview that kind of impeded them from actually like seeing what was really going on. Like that's one of these cool things about seeing seeing the world through Bitcoin is you can you can see a more positive mentality in the world. Like there there yeah. is a lot more potential. Like like it is like you can view the different operating systems from each other almost. Like like I. I yeah, you, you you see the Keynesian world, you put on the Bitcoin lens and, and like, yeah, once once you start contrasting it from outside of the system, all of the cracks and the flaws start becoming very apparent. But getting others to come on board and, and see what we see is incredibly challenging because they are heavily invested in the world as it as it works in the way that they understand it. And challenging that worldview requires a significant amount of mental work to, yeah, just update yourself and update yeah. what yeah there's an admission there's like a, you know an inherent admission that you were wrong about a lot and uh that's difficult to do for a lot of people in the best case ryan you've been great as always man we're coming up on an hour i, I just want to maybe finish with one last question um the montreal conference you're going you're playing hockey are you you're on a panel i believe as well are you not uh probably at least one panel talking about the relationship energy and bitcoin and future grids and microgrids and I'm not sure exactly who I'm going to be on the panel with, but it's yeah, very likely that um, I'll be speaking with with uh, someone that uh, Dan Carlin introduced me to recently from Hydro Quebec. So I'm I'm looking forward to that one because he's very familiar with with the uh, with grid and demand response programs, and because Quebec actually has a demand response program that the miners are actually very heavily participating in. Yeah, similar yeah. to to Texas. So I, I was not aware of how extensive that that actually was. Like I knew there was plenty of miners in Quebec. And they had the the moratorium, but they uh, yeah they're apparently serving quite a positive role on their grid, and he's he's working to shift that narrative from the inside. So I'm supporting his work as much as I can from connecting him with other people that I know, and we're probably gonna have a pretty good talk about the the future that we can build if these trends that we are all kind of tapped into can continue to manifest themselves. And did. Did you hear Bob say when he was talking with Len the other day that they're making a 10 terahash chip? Yeah. That, that they're going to put together into a machine that's going to take like 10 kilowatts? That like, guy, that guy that, is like, holy he's, crap. He's great. He's great. The, the absolute power density that those machines are going to have is insane. Yeah. The, and, this is like, uh, it's really futuristic kind of. I mean, I don't, I don't know enough to say how realistic that is. How realistic is that? Is that legit? Is that, is that like something that's actually going to get done? I don't know. He's the, got the domain experience and expertise, and he says he's got like one of the top-notch chip guys in the world working with him on this. So we will wait and see. 
God I hope bless it him. manifests into something, something awesome. But like, it sounds like they want to make all these machines just out of the box. You'll just be able to plug them in and they'll just synchronize with whatever variables you want, whether it's temperature, the grid, the prices. Yeah. And yeah, they won't have, they'll have to, a lot less of this kludgy aftermarket firmware <laughs> stuff that they're, they're working with right now, where they've got to, they've got to rig everything up and everybody's got their own like proprietary black box that they use to sync with the grids and then different apps somebody, for everything. somebody makes different. something that's, that's too similar. And then they, then they start like suing each other to yeah. vote this stuff. And it, uh, it was getting silly there for a little while. Cause it's like, no, you're all coming to the same conclusion from your own unique, unique paths. And it's just, it just, it made sense that we're yeah it's, you, it sounds a, about right eh? yeah you've got an awesome load and it's it's got a very important role to play in the future of our power systems i'm looking forward a lot to your talk i'm glad you previewed it now as always uh with the guests here tell people before we leave where they can find you what you're working on and uh if there's anything else you want to plug books articles good stuff as far as resources what's all yours buddy yeah um Nuclear Bitcoiner, the, it's in the name there, uh, on X, on the the Noster, whichever whichever Noster app you prefer on that. I won't read out my NPUB, but um, a few <laughs> a few podcasts that I like to keep up on nuclear stuff, as Decoupled was mentioned earlier, Titans of Nuclear is another good one. They've uh, actually been doing a series recently specifically about data centers. And actually, that's one, one gripe that I want to mention is that they only started to really talking excitedly about data centers and nuclear power after Amazon bought the data center that Terra Wolf and Cumulus Coin had already really? started building. They, like, it, it seems like I, I've been poking around and it seems like the only person that has any awareness of this is is Mark Nelson. Like, he's great on yeah, this yeah. topic. That's, but everyone hey, Mark else is Nelson like, is, Mark is Nelson, like, people who don't know, is far, Energy as, Bants on Twitter, right? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. a great follow. Uh, actually, we're going to, he's going to be on a Twitter space Thursday morning with, uh, that, we, that we do, uh, I was at the, the the daily Bitcoin show or something. Nice, but uh, definitely worth checking out. He's going to be there. Um, but it's uh, yeah, everyone. It they it's it's like the they're talking about it as if like, well, this is the first manifestation of the the the, the data center with the, <laughs> the nuclear reactor. And it's like, well, no, come on, guys, we were already on this like two years ago. Tal yeah. Ter Wolf was way ahead <laughs> of the game. And then whatever Justin Orkney's doing at with standard power like in ohio like they've got similar plans like it looks like they had pretty good foresight to to start building these data center campuses well in advance of the broader public really starting to catch on and i just saw another one uh where the hell was it bitcoin is always ahead in, of the, the game here when it comes to in connecticut yeah connecticut one of their reactors they they're talking about building a 300 megawatt data center behind the meter nice nice yeah. So this is Behind, uh, it's so it's so good it's so good well well it makes sense because there's there's great security you don't yeah. have to build the infrastructure you you save on a lot of delivery costs and yeah the the power is there so yeah a big a big static data center plus like a, a modest size like flexible load center like the bitcoin miners yeah and that'll be like the perfect set like because then you've you've got a lot more flexibility in your nuclear powers if you've got that that type of load associated with it yeah sorry i keep talking and <laughs> because just the ideas keep coming it's like oh yeah well this yeah well, there this was this is why, we that. <laughs> this is why this is why we have you on man because like you're you're a wealth of information and i think for all the podcasts that are going on out there you know len and i do a show every week where we talk about bitcoin economics blah blah, blah. it's fun it's it's it, it, interesting it's i think it's important but there's a lot of stuff that's going on on the periphery and nuclear bitcoin grid management and the way these things work together in an environment and during a time when there's demand for consistency, effectiveness, and price efficiency, this is important. And it's a big thing that we can really grab onto as a community and say, look, we got an answer for this. We've been working on it. We have proof of concept and we have proof of execution in a number of places around the world. Listen to us when we give you this information. So yeah, I mean, Ryan, it's it's always good to have you. Do you want to um, give a price prediction before you go? Or no, for the, for the conference? what what how many k by conference day i gotta start asking all the guests that because we have like i have another guest tomorrow who's not a bitcoiner so i won't be able to ask him how many k oh, by conference day oh we're gonna piss people off and we're gonna go we're, we're gonna go down to 50k because oh. like, I've, I've got i've got stacking goals here like i i would i would love another nice dip like that before we go off to crazy town <laughs> like i'm not hopeful that we're gonna get it like the other week when it was well, like in Canadian dollars, because that's what I, I see it at. We're like in 90, 
ninety-five thousand or something. It was right almost one hundred k, or it did get to one hundred k. It, it, it touched right? it, but like the other day, just before I got paid, it had dipped down to like eighty-seven, and then two hours before my paycheck hits, it's ninety-three again. <laughs> you son of a bitch! <laughs> like, this is the nature of the game, buddy. It's the nature of the oh, game. Oh yeah, if you want it to do something, it'll yeah, it'll keep you keep you guessing. But I love it, Ryan McLeod, Nuclear Bitcoiner. Follow him, like his stuff, and uh, until next time, everybody. We'll uh, we'll see ya.